thank you, Father. Amen. I used to be a boxer. I know I don't look like one now, but I used to be a boxer. And in boxing, we have categories. We have fly weight. We have bottom weight. We have light weight. We have middle weight. But the place where the real money is is in the heavy weight. So when I have somebody talk about heavy weight, hallelujah. I know the devil is in trouble. Several years ago, we wanted to start a branch of the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Abuja. And I was in my room at Sheraton Hotel, seeking the face of the Lord. Cry out to him, Father, tonight we are starting the program. I want you to please perform miracles, signs, wonders. Suddenly, I heard his voice. He said to me, shut up. Am I your houseboy? God, do this for me. God, do that for me. He said, all I've done for you, how much thanks have you given me? He said to me, he said, for the next three days, I don't want to hear any prayer from you, just thank me. I tried hard. Oh, Father, I thank you. Father, I appreciate you. And, but please don't forget tonight. And he said, no. I said, just thank me, praise me. Towards the end of the third day, he said, now, go home. Go and get the elders to begin to go around and strengthen the foundation. He said, because all you have seen thus far is addition. I'm about to begin multiplication. Some time ago, somebody pulled down 15 redeem churches within two weeks in Abuja. We didn't even feel it. Today, in the greater Abuja, we have more than a thousand branches. My beloved children, for the next five minutes, I want you to praise God, give him heavy weight praise, praise him like you have never done before. Give him glory, give him honor, give him adoration, sing unto him, 
dance unto him, praise him like he's never done before, and watch him in action. Praise him, sing unto him, clap unto him, dance unto him, praise the King of kings, the Lord of lords, praise the I am that I am, praise the ancient of days, magnify his holy name, praise him.
In Jesus mighty name we worship. Alpha Omega Alpha Omega You are worthy of our praises Today You are worthy of our praises Today Hallelujah Omega, the beginning and the ending, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come, the Almighty, wonderful Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, glory be to your holy name. Father, accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for all you did in 2023. Thank you for bringing us to 2024. Thank you because the devil has lost the battle over us. Glory be to your holy name, Lord. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Please, tonight in the life of every one of your children, do something new. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. <clears throat> Another heavy weight, hallelujah. Now, I want to... I want you to shake hands with two or three people you have not seen yet this year and say Happy New Year, God bless you. And then you may please be seated. Well, Happy New Year to all of you. God bless you mightily in Jesus' name. Ah, well, those born in the month of January, please remain standing. If you are born in January, let me hear your own hallelujah. Father, I commit all your children born in the month of January into your hands. January is the, the beginning of the year. 
In every area in the life of this, your children, let there be a new beginning. A new beginning of joy, of progress, of promotion, of success, of abundance, of anointing, of a closer walk with God. Let it be well with them and let them serve you. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Well, let somebody shout another hallelujah. I want to bless the name of the Lord for the young man who spoke before me. That was good. That was a very good beginning to a very great year. This year will be great for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus chapter 3, from verse 1 through 5. Exodus 3, from verse 1 to 5. Tonight we are beginning a series entitled From the Mountain Top. So today is part one. In February, by the grace of God, we'll go to part two, and so on and so forth. Exodus 3, reading from verse 1 to 5. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked. And behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh either. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place where thou, whereon thou standest is holy ground. Hmm. Moses had been a fugitive for 40 years. He's been running from Pharaoh because of something that happened in Exodus chapter 2 from verse 11 to 23. Exodus 2, 11 to 23. You know the story. Moses went to see his brethren in Egypt saw two of them. I saw one of them being tormented by the Egyptian and decided to help. In the process, he killed the Egyptian and uh, buried him. The following day, he saw two of his brethren fighting and he said, uh -uh. If the enemy is tormenting one of you, we can understand. How can the two of you be tormenting each other? And one of them said, Oh, who made you judge over us? You want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Or she said, Oh, I thought the secret was hid. But the news has spread. The Bible says Pharaoh then tried to kill Moses, and Moses fled. And for 40 years, he had been a fugitive. 
But now it's time for repositioning has come. Because Pharaoh died. I have good news for somebody here tonight. The one who has been making life unbearable for you, if it's not already gone, will be gone very soon. <laughs> David was a fugitive for 13 years after God has anointed him to be king. But the father-in-law kept on pursuing him for 13 years. But according to 1 Samuel chapter 31, from verse 1 to 6, 1 Samuel 31, from verse 1 to 6, King Saul died. And the years of running from uh, David came to an end. You see, there's always a set time. According to Psalm 102, from I mean, verse 13, Psalm 102, verse 13, and the Bible says, God will arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the said time has come. After the Holy Ghost Congress of last year, the time to favor someone came. And when your time comes, Nobody can stop you. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 46, Genesis 41, verse 46, the time for Joseph came at the age of 37. He was a young boy when he had dreams of greatness of what he was going to become but when you read Genesis chapter 40 you can read it from verse 1 to 23 Genesis 40 from verse 1 to 23 in spite of everything that he had been able to achieve in prison in slavery in prison the, the one who was supposed to Help him, forgot him. But when the time came, he was remembered. I have good news for somebody here tonight. The time for the Almighty God to remember you has come. You see, when God's time to reposition you comes, uh, you won't have to worry about your enemies much further. The king of kings himself will take care of the enemy. When you read 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 1 to 8, 1 Kings 19 from verse 1 to 8, and pay attention to everything you hear tonight because you will testify. <laughs> After God repositioned Elijah on the same Mount Horeb, where he repositioned Moses, 
Elijah never ran from anybody any longer. As a matter of fact, by the time you get to 1 Samuel chapter 21, from verse 20 to 24, 1 Samuel 21, from verse 20 to 24, the hunted became the hunter. <laughs> I have good news for somebody here tonight. All those who have been hunting you, if they are wise, when they see you coming, they will run. You see, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 54, when you read from verse 15 to 17, Isaiah 54 from verse 15 to 17, the Almighty God stated clearly concerning you. He said, if the enemies gang up against you, they will fall. He said, there is none of their weapons fashioned against you that will prosper. He said, even if they criticize you, you will rebuke them. That is in the Bible. So when once in a while you hear me say something that may sound a bit tough to you, it's because it is in the scriptures. I want somebody to say loud and clear, enough is enough. From this moment on, anybody who criticizes you without cause, God will shut his mouth. <laughs> One of my daughters shared a testimony with me yesterday. It's not a testimony you can share in public. I think it was during the Congress that the word came that the one who had been tormented, tormenting the family will not see the end of the year. Both herself and her husband jumped up and said amen because they knew who was tormenting their own family. She came yesterday to tell me, sir, the tormentor is gone. <laughs> so I decree to somebody else tonight, every tormentor of your family will not see the end of this month. When God reposition you, the next thing you can expect is divine visitation. Moses moved the cattle. To Mount Horeb. What's he doing on the mountain? Grass is supposed to be on the plain for the goats and the sheep. What was he doing on the mountain top? God repositioned him. The Almighty God systematically worked in our lives. You heard him say the walls are down before he moved us to divine repositioning. 
And now, by the grace of God, we are on the mountain top. And whether the devil likes it or not, we are staying on the mountain top. And so, as he was on the mountain top, incidentally, when we talk about mountain top, being on the mountain top, that's another way of saying you are fasting. <laughs> and you know, we always we are known for fasting. And so, get ready from January 11. For 50 days only. <laughs> Glory be to God. Believe it or not, many people are copying us now. Initially, when we were fasting, they thought we were fools. Now they are copying. When you are on the mountain top, First thing you can expect is divine visitation. Why? James chapter 4, verse 8. James 4, verse 8. The word of God made it abundantly clear. You draw near to God, He will draw near you. He pulls you on the mountain top, then He will come closer to you. And whenever God wants to visit somebody, he will reposition the fellow first. For example, if you read Genesis chapter 18 from verse 1 to 14, Genesis 18 from verse 1 to 14, when God wanted to visit Abraham, he brought him out of the tent. The Bible said he was by the door of the tent. It was where, just like my son said, the wind can touch him when the wind is blowing past. When God repositions you, he will pay you a visit. Somebody is about to receive a divine visitation from you. He will reposition you so he can pay you a visit so that prophecies can become a decree. You know uh, the story of Abraham very well. God had been prophesying to him, this will happen, that will happen. And then all of a sudden, he changed the prophecies to, hey, I decree nine months from now, you will have a son. I'm standing as a representative of the Almighty God to you, and I hereby decree every prophecy you have received will be fulfilled this month. When David was not where he was supposed to be for divine visitation, God repositioned him. First Samuel chapter 16. You can read it from verse 1 to 13. First Samuel 16 from verse 1 to 13. David was to be anointed king. The man of God was there in the house. Where is the king? Some pretenders were showing forth. God kept on saying, no, not this one, no, not this one. Until finally the man of God said, hey, where is? Are you sure these are all your children? The father said, well, there is one more. That is not material for kingship. That's why the man of God said, we won't sit down until you bring him. 
I have good news for somebody here today. All those who are needed to bring you to divine contact, they won't rest until they do so. In First King chapter 17, First King chapter 17. Thank you, Daddy. God asked me to tell you a story. <laughs> Quite an interesting story. When I was uh, a teacher at Tropego Federal Grammar School, I was seen on the stage. I was the games master, so I, I took our boys to Akure for a game. And there I met a man, another games master. And as we normally would do, we were boasting before the match. Oh, my team will defeat yours. Uh, it is with a basket that you will carry home your own goals, etc., etc. Anyway, we just met briefly, and, and then we parted after the game. Years passed, and I came to the University of Lagos to do my master's. I was almost finishing when one day I saw this man. Ah. Hello, how are you, etc., etc. Where are you now? Oh, he said, I'm working with the Ministry, Federal Ministry of Education. Uh, I said, you people. He said, what's wrong with us? He said, I applied to you for a scholarship. And you didn't even invite me for interview, even if you are not going to give me. At least you could have invited me. He said, you applied? I said, yes. He said, what course are you doing? I said, ah, you know, I'm doing mathematics. He said, we were looking for somebody in mathematics to give a scholarship to. We don't know what happened to your application. I said, is that so? You want me to reapply? He said, no, wait. Few days later, I got a letter from the Federal Ministry of Education giving me scholarship. I'm backdating it to the very first time I applied. The Lord asked me to tell you that story. He said, I have repositioned someone who will help you. In 1st King chapter 17, from verse 8 to 16, 1st King 17 from verse 8 to 16, the Almighty God made sure that he repositioned the widow of Zarephath. She was outside there looking for wood. And he repositioned Elijah who arrived just on time to see the widow. The widow got a divine visitation because God did some repositioning. In the name that's above every other name, before this month is over, somebody will get a divine visitation. Now, at times, God re will reposition you so you can see the unusual. See, when you're on the mountain top, you can see further than somebody who is in the valley. If you have ever been in an aeroplane, you will discover that the higher the aeroplane goes, the further you can see. 
when you're on the ground, houses will block your sight. When it just will go higher and higher, you see more and more. In Genesis chapter 13, from verse 14 to 17, Genesis 13 from verse 14 to 17, uh, the Bible made it clear that the more you can see, the more you can have. He told Abraham, hey, don't just stand on one spot, walk the length and breadth of the land. Whatever you can see, you get. So occasionally God reposition you to the mountain top so you can see far, so you can see what God is about to make available to you. And in Matthew 17, from verse 1 to 9, and I think I heard my son making reference to that passage. In Matthew 17, from verse 1 to 9, the Lord took three people with him to the Mount of Transfiguration to see what ordinary eyes could not see. They saw the Lord transform, transfigured. They saw Moses, Moses, who had been dead for hundreds of years. They saw Elijah, they saw what ordinary eyes could not see because the Lord repositioned them to the mountain top. I have good news for somebody. Beginning from this year, you begin to see the invisible. In Mark chapter 5, thank you, Father. Yeah, I know this, this is it's going to be a very special night and the beginning of a special year. Hmm. The Lord wants me to tell you another story. <laughs> Some people say I tell stories it's because I've seen a bit. I've been around for more than 80 years. Way back in 1962, there's a place called College of Agriculture in Akure. I believe it's still there. In those days, young people would go there, study for two years, and you become an agric officer. And when you graduate, they give you a motorcycle. The name of the motorcycle then was Triumph. <laughs> and when you say young man, <laughs> some of the older ones they will remember. They say young man sitting on Triumph, and the boom, boom. Uh, no girl could resist him. Because the girl would want to sit at the back of a man riding triumph. <laughs> so the local government uh, that I belong to then, the Lelujio Kebo Local Government Council, decided they wanted to give scholarship for someone to go to the College of Agric. And two of us applied. One fellow from Ileluji and myself from Okebo. And we had the interview, and the interview was very simple. But in any case, they wanted to choose one man, and they chose the other man. I was sad. Three years passed. And I met that man that, you know, we struggled together, the one who won. Of course, by now he was riding his triumph. <laughs> and I was in my final year in the university. 
when I told him that I was in my final year in the university, he said, oh God, I thought I was a winner. I didn't know I was a loser. Daddy asked me to tell you the story. And he said, the fellow concerned will understand. He said, last year you lost a river. This year I will give you a notion. In Mark chapter 5, from verse 35 to 43, Mark 5, 35 to 43, when God wanted, when the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to show Peter, James, and John how to raise the dead, he repositioned the three of them in Jairus' house. He kept the others outside, moved the three inside. They were there when he raised Jairus' daughter. Years later, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, from verse 36 to 42, Acts 9, from verse 36 to 42, when Peter was going to raise Dorcas from the dead, he followed the example shown him by the Lord Jesus Christ. When he repositioned you, particularly to the mountain top, is so that you can see the invisible that will lead you even to further promotion. In 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 9 to 15, 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 9 to 15, When Elijah was about to be taken away by wild wind to heaven, and he asked Elisha, what do you want? And Elisha said, I just want a double portion of your power. The condition was, if you can see me. If you can see the invisible. I pray in the name that's above every other name. God, we open your eyes tonight. <laughs> By the way, it might be a good idea if you begin to write down your prayer points as I go along. Prayer point number one, you want to thank the Almighty God for bringing you to the new year. That should be number one for bringing you into the new year and for repositioning you. That should be your prayer point number one. Well, prayer point number two will be, Father, after all these years as a fugitive, please remember me. Just like you remembered Moses, please remember me tonight. Prayer point number three will be, Father, any Pharaoh left in my life, Don't let him or her see the end of this month. That's prayer point number three. Father, any Pharaoh left in my life, don't let him or her see the end of this month. Okay, now, why would God need to reposition you to the mountain top? Because occasionally God needs to pull you apart for you to hear His voice.
he needed to pull Moses apart from the noise in the, in the valley below. Come apart. Why do we need to fast? We fast because during the period of fasting, we don't talk much. We need to conserve our energy. And we have time, more time to pray. And we have time to hear from God. You see, because in 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, Thank you, Father. He says, everyone. The Lord said, there's someone here who is afraid of promotion. Because you know what the enemies did to destroy your former boss. And Daddy asked me to tell you, I will promote you and protect you. <laughs> In 1 Kings chapter 19, from verse 4 to 21, 1 Kings 19, from verse 4 to 21, you read that when God wants to speak to you, when he wants to tell you about your future, he wants to tell you about the rest of your destiny. He speaks in small, still voice. When God speaks in a cloud, when he has, when there is a cloud, there he has to shout. In John chapter twelve, from us. 28 to 29, John 12, verse 28 to 29. When he spoke to a crowd, the people thought it was thunder. But when he wants to speak to you alone, he's always in small, still voice. And you know, Matthew chapter 13 from verse 10 to 16, Matthew 13 from verse 10 to 16 says, there are things that only blessed ears can hear. It's not every ear that can hear God speak. I'm believing God for you that from tonight onward you will begin to hear God yourself. When God is speaking, He speaks in small, still voice. And remember the first time I had a prophecy, a word of prophecy. I was at the University of Lagos, I've just been born again, and someone took me to a garden of a fellow brethren. And we were worshiping God, singing, praising Him. At that time, I didn't know many of the choruses, so whenever they are singing the choruses, I kept on making a joyful noise. And then all of a sudden, I see if somebody said, keep quiet. Nobody said it, but all of a sudden, everybody became quiet. Suddenly, one brother began to prophesy, Thus saith the Lord. And he kept on going. And I know the man who took me there. I said, uh, When did God say that? He said to me, Shh, God is speaking. I said, I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> After that day, I cried unto God, I want to hear from you myself. You see, if you can hear from God yourself, no prophet can deceive you. The ability to hear from the Most High God, I decree today, be given unto you. Amen. 
when he speaks, he speaks in small, still voice. And so only blessed ears can hear him. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, from verse 1 to 9, 1 Samuel chapter 3, from verse 1 to 9, when God was calling Samuel, 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 the boy got up, ran to Eli. Eli was sleeping nearby. Eli didn't hear because the link between Eli and God had been broken. Eli said, I didn't call you, go and lie down. The boy came back again the second time when God called him. Eli said, I didn't call you. Then the third time, Eli realized that it was God who was calling. Then he said to the boy, when he calls you next time, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. How many of you would like to hear from God very, very soon? Let me hear you say, Amen, Lord. Amen. Write down your prayer, prayer point. Is it number four now or five? He said, Father, please open my ears. I want to hear from you. If you can't hear from him, you'll be deceived. Particularly in a world full of all manners of prophets now. There were prophets who prophesied last year that the man who is going to be a president, his name must be in the Bible. All manners of prophecies and all manners are already going out again. Like I told you, those of you who are here at the watch night service, there are so many prophets speaking now that I feel I should just keep my mouth shut. I'm a pastor anyway. But if you can hear God yourself, then nobody can deceive you. If you can hear God yourself, when somebody is prophesying, something within you will tell you quietly, hey, I didn't send that fellow. So, Father, open my ears. I want to be hearing from you. And then your prayer point that follows that one is, speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. Speak. I'm ready to hear and I'm ready to obey. Hmm. And then Moses was on the mountain top. God repositioned him. Then God paid him a visit. He saw the invisible, he saw fire burning a bush, the bush was not burnt. And then he heard the voice of God because God opened his ears and he heard. And what was it he heard? His name being called Moses. Moses. And he was wondering, who is calling me? After 40 years, when you hear from God, it's most likely you will hear the voice of destiny calling. The voice of destiny calling. In the case of Samuel that I mentioned earlier, 1 Samuel chapter 3, you can read the whole chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 3, from verse 1 to the end. After that calling, 
Samuel, Samuel. It wasn't long when it was said, the whole nation discovered ah, there is a new prophet in the land. When you read 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verse 11 to 13, 1 Samuel 16 from verse 11 to 13, if you read it with understanding, you will see that Jesse sent somebody to go and bring David. I'm sure that when that fellow got to where David was, it was with excitement that he called, David, David. And David says, yes, what's happening? Ah, I said, prophet in our house. He said, nobody will sit down until we bring you. Call of destiny. In Acts chapter 9 from verse 1 to 6, Acts chapter 9 from verse 1 to 6, when Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus and the Lord repositioned him, knocked him down from his horse, <laughs> he had God called Saul, Saul. I hope you are not afraid of hearing God calling you. You have already prayed, you already, you've, you've written it down. Speak, Lord, let someone hear it. If you hear him calling your name, it can be the call of destiny. And he's going to call somebody tonight. Ah, thank you, my father. The Lord asked me to tell somebody. He said, all your headaches, mental headache, financial headache, marital headache, all your headaches will be gone this year. Thank you, Daddy. Daddy wants me to tell someone. And say, you are knocking at a door. And say, the door has refused to open. Ask me to tell you to keep knocking because that door will not only open but lead to other doors. I think the Lord is asking me to run off for today because he's talking. When he's talking like this, it means he's doesn't want me to delay what he wants to do any further. Because he asked me to tell you yet another story. And maybe after that we'll round up. You've heard the story before. About 40 years ago, or ago now, 40 something years ago, I went to visit our church in Ilorin. When I was about to leave, the midwives came to me and said, sir, we have a problem, we have a case. A woman came to deliver and has told us that he has a covenant that the day of delivery will be the day she will die. Uh, we said, if that is the case, then why do you come to our maternity center? I said, well, I've changed my mind. Ah. 
Okay. And in any case, so we prayed and I left. Left on Wednesday. On Saturday, I was of course back in Lagos and the brethren came from Ilori to say, sir, the woman you prayed for shortly after you left gave birth to a, boy, a, a, a baby. But we discovered there's yet another baby in the womb. And we have been praying since then, the second baby has not come. Ah. By night was Saturday. I'm telling you the truth. I, my stomach trembled. I had to put up a bold face. Is that why you came all the way from Ilori? Don't you know that the same God in Lagos is the same God in Ilori? Go back, my, my beloved people. Uh, before you get home, the second baby would have come. Give them a bottle of Coke or so each and send them back. As soon as they left, I ran to my prayer room. I fell on my face before God. I said, oh God, this is the day of trouble. You asked me to call on you in the day of trouble. Help me now. <laughs> and God spoke and said, huh, you mean you didn't believe what you said? Huh. I said, I believe. I believe, but uh, I sent them away so that I can come and <laughs> discuss the issue with you. God have mercy on General Overseer. And God said, okay, if you believe, then go and eat. Ah, no, today is Saturday, Lord, you know I'm fasting for tomorrow's service. God said, go and eat, if you believe. Well, I had. Like I've always told you when you had the story before, whether the food went through my mouth or through my nose, I can't recall. But before they got home, the woman has delivered not just another baby, but two more. <laughs> the Lord asked me to tell you that story because he said there's someone here who's crying to him for two special miracles. He said, I will give you three. The Lord said to Moses, he said, uh, Oh, you want to write down your prayer point before I go to conclusion now. And say, Father, let me hear the call of destiny tonight. Let me hear the call of destiny. Let, let, let me know where I'm heading. Let me hear the call of destiny tonight. So the Lord said to Moses, Hey, Moses, I see now that uh, I've gotten your attention. But uh, where you are standing is now holy ground. When God repositions you, He will bring you into contact with Himself. And if there's anything at all that God wants to be known for, it's for His holiness. Isaiah chapter 61, Isaiah chapter 6 rather, Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1 to 3, Isaiah 6, 1 to 3. The angels are always crying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. The Quizzle have been crying, mighty, mighty, mighty. God is almighty. 
The queen people have been crying, merciful, merciful, merciful. God is rich in mercy. They could be crying, faithful, faithful, faithful. God is faithful. But what are they crying? Holy, holy, holy. Don't let anybody deceive you. The master key to dealing in close contact with God is holiness. Anywhere you hear about God, you hear about his holiness. Exodus 15 verse 11. Exodus 15 verse 11 is a cause glorious in holiness. Glorious in holiness. When he touches anything, that thing becomes holy. He touches ordinary mud. He said that place is now holy ground. Holy. And before he can use anybody, he will purify the fellow. Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 4 to 8. Isaiah 6, 4 to 8. When Isaiah saw the Almighty God in all his holiness, he said, Oh God, I'm done for. Look at me. Even my lips are unclean. God sent an angel to take a coal of fire to purify that mouth. And then God will now say, Hey, who shall I say who will go for me? Malachi chapter 6, sorry, Malachi chapter 3, from verse 2 to 4. Malachi 3, 2 to 4. The Almighty God made it clear, He will purify the sons of Levi. Before they can serve him acceptably. You want to be used of God? You must be ready for purification. Ah. Amen, Daddy. Thank you, Father. I received this one before I tell you. Because the Lord said there's someone here tonight. He said, throughout this year, anywhere, anytime you need me, I will be there for you. You cannot walk with God in sin. He is a holy God. You say, we know that's how you are going to end there. Yes, so that's how I'm going to end. Because my God is a holy God. You want him by your side? You want him to show you the invisible? You want him to remember all your years of captivity and put an end to it? You want him to silence all those who are standing between you and your goal? You want him to draw close to you? You must be holy. Anyone telling you anything other than that is a joker. So one of your prayers then is, Father, purify me. 
I want to write that down. Father, purify me. Make me pure. And then those of you who are not yet born again, if you know you are still living in sin, and yet you want association with this holy God, ah, you better come and surrender your life to him until he has washed away your sin. You can begin to enjoy him. So if you want to become closely associated with my God, come now, I'm going to count from one to 10. Before I say 10, make sure you are already standing before the altar. And then we'll pray for your salvation before we continue. So I'm counting now. One. Two. And this year, if you don't want to clap for God, don't clap. But if you want to clap for him, then do it, and do it very well. Three. There is power mighty in his blood that will wash away all sins. Seven. Eight. Now keep coming, keep coming. I can see some of you running from my power. Just keep coming, don't stop. Make sure you get there before I finish praying. Nine. Now those of you already in front and those of you are on the way, cry unto the Almighty God. And say, Lord, please have mercy on me. Save my soul. Forgive all my sins. Let your blood wash me clean. I want to be clean. I want to be one of your children. I don't want to have anything to do with sin anymore. Father, please save my soul. Give me genuine salvation. My future is in your hands, Lord. Please save my soul. I want to become a child of the living God. And the rest of us, please, let's stretch our hands towards these our beloved ones and pray for them. Intercede that the Almighty God will have mercy on them, that He will wash them clean with His blood. He will write their names in the book of life, that they can become members of the family of God. Please intercede for them, brethren. Intercede for them.
And those of you on the way, hurry up now. Because I'm about to pray the prayer of salvation. Don't stop. Just make sure you keep coming. Be here before I finish praying. Thank you, Father. And the counselors can begin to come now. Amen. My Father, my God, I want to say thank you for your word. Thank you for all these people that have responded to the altar call. Please remember your promise that whosoever will come unto you, you will know why cast out. They've come to you now, my Father, my God. Please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away their sins. Please write their names in the book of life. Let them become members of the family of God. And from now on, whenever they call on you, please answer them by fire. And let them serve you to the very end. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Now, those of you who have come forward, let me hear you shout hallelujah. I'm rejoicing with you because from now on, by the grace of God, I'll be praying for you. So I need your name, your address, and your prayer requests. The counselors are already around you, or they will come very quickly and they will give you cards to fill. You give me your name, your address, and your prayer requests, and I promise you by the grace of God that I'll be praying for you. Congratulations. We'll wait for minutes for you to finish filling your forms before we continue.
very much. Well, there's only one more prayer point that you want to add to the one you have written, and that's your own special request. Anything special you want to ask God, you can add it to that one. Um, now, the altar is open. And the Almighty God is waiting. He's ready to answer prayers. You start by thanking Him, and then you take your prayer points one by one. You have about 15 minutes to go. Cry to Him, He will answer you.
Jesus mighty name we have prayed the almighty God will grant your request he will remember you today before this month ends there will be no Pharaoh left in your life He will visit you. He will open your eyes. He will open your ears. He will draw you close to himself. He will show you what is to come. He will guide you to your destiny. He shall be well with you. He will purify you. He will make you a vessel unto honor in his hand. Your tomorrow will be all right. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Well, let's hear a heavyweight hallelujah. 